delighted to be collaborating with USAID, Development Innovation Ventures, DIV team, and our partner, Avishka, to present to you an interactive pitch simulation today. My name is Alan Obilo, a management consultant with IntelliCup Advisory Services based in Nairobi, Kenya. I work with early stage enterprises and startups in sub saharan Africa. I support them in business process engineering as well as investment facilitation. I'm also joined by my colleague, Sarah Makena, and also Kavya. IntelliCup and DIV share common interest in testing and scaling innovative, impactful solution that can, be, that can tackle complex development challenges affecting base of the pyramid, as well as desire to help innovators position themselves for future growth and support. Let me give you a brief overview of DIV. So DIV is a USAID open innovation competition that tests and scales creative solutions to any global development challenge in any country where USAID operates and in any sector from anywhere, including from profit and nonprofits, researchers, academic institutions, faith-based organizations, and government and governments. DIV was founded in 2010 and has made 225 awards across 47 countries, impacting 55 million beneficiaries. In 2020, USAID Development Innovation Venture invested about 15.8 million in new ideas, and they are looking for more great solutions now. If you might be interested, check out their website, www.usaid.gov stroke DIV. We are hoping this session will help you educate potential applicants, including both SANCALP attendees and the general public regarding DIV selection criteria. So one of the things DIVs are looking uh, seriously around is how innovative your business is. And I would also want to understand, to give you a brief definition of innovation. So in, in DIV's perspective, innovation casts a broad net for what's innovative and that could mean new technology, either as a product or a service, new ways of delivering that service or product or financing services and goods, new ways of increasing uptake of the existing proven solution, and also policy shifts based on learning from behavioral economies. In the past, DIV has funded a broad variety of innovators, including those with solution from off-grid energies to rats that sniff out of tuberculosis, road safety sticker campaigns, affordable clean drinking water. DIV uses a tiered funding model that allows USA to make small calculated bets to test promising ideas and invest more resources in the impact, in the highest impact and most cost effective solutions. Feasibility funding amounts range from 200,000 US dollar to 5 million. So that's the range DIV and USAID mostly work around. Uh, so how can DIV diligence and select among the vast diversity application be received? So one of the things they look more keenly is the investment criteria. And around the investment criteria, they are focusing on impact, evidence of impact, cost effectiveness, pathway to scale, and financial sustainability. And basically for this session, those are some of the major angles that we are going to take also. Looking at the evidence of impact, cost effectiveness, path to scale, and financial stability. For today, today's innovation pitch simulation is an education session in which four entrepreneurs who are selected and evaluated by IntelliCup will deliver their pitches before a panel of judges, Sarah, Jackim, Erin, and Godfrey, 
who have an understanding of DIV. The judges will provide feedback and ask questions from each pitch. I also want to emphasize that this simulation is not in any way a predictive of what an actual DIV investment committee might decide. This session is only designed to help illustrate to the potential applicants and the participants how the selection criteria might apply. Thank you so much. So first, let me introduce the judges to give a quick introduction. Just a one minute to introduction, then we get into the first presentation. I would want to introduce Sarah, if you can just unmute and maybe give us a one minute introduction. Hi everyone, I'm Sarah Birch here at Rippleworks. I'm the managing director where I work with scaling startups in emerging market. Uh, I'd go to Erin. Sure, hi everyone. Uh, I worked at Div for about two years, uh, a couple years ago, and now I, I work for on um, evidence-based policy in the domestic context in the US for a philanthropy called Arnold Ventures. So I'm very excited to be here. Thank you so much. And then Hakim, next please. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Joaquin Carbonell. Uh, I worked at Div for about three and a half years as a portfolio, ma portfolio manager. And um, after that, uh, did work, technical assistance work uh, with Harvard's Government Performance Lab. Um, and now I'm a student again, um, studying data science, but I'm um, going to get back into, into the field this fall. Looking forward to, to chatting with you guys. Thank you. And lastly, I also want to introduce Godfrey. Yeah, thank you, Alan. They've all done it in less than uh, one second, but I'm going to take the one minute you've given me. My name is Godfrey Mindari. I am one of the three partners of the Avishka Capital Africa Fund. It's a $100 million fund that we are currently fundraising. We are also on the road, just like the entrepreneurs that we are talking to today. But before I joined Avishka, I used to work for Acumen Fund six years as the regional director for Acumen Fund for West Africa. I have also worked for the African Development Bank for seven years in Tunisia until the Arab Spring when the place became chaotic and I could not stay any longer and I moved my family. I am a, a banker. I am a mining engineer turned banker. I started my banking career with Barclays Capital in London and later on joined Standard Bank in South Africa where I spent five years, both in South Africa head office and as well as uh, Tanzania as the director for retail banking. So you will see, I have seen both investment banking side, commercial banking, development finance, and impact investing. And I think this is my Damascus moment because impact investing is what I am now, I've embarked on for a couple of years now. And what the entrepreneurs are doing are the type of entrepreneurs, if we finish raising our fund, we will be looking at, and we are very passionate because we feel you can make money but still doing good. And that's why I'm excited to be part of this panel. Thank you very much, Alan. Thank you so much, Joe. I Good. hope I did it in, three, in one minute. <laughs> sure, he did it too. You covered a minute for other who took lesser than that, so that's still fine. Thank you, the judges, for spending this, this time with us here to evaluate these companies, to give your feedback, and to ask relevant questions which are more in line with what DIV would be looking for in any enterprise would want to apply for the grant. And for now, I would just want to give a very brief format of the pitching. So the pitches would take five minutes. Generally, the entrepreneurs would share their screen and present for five minutes. Then thereafter, there would be a question and answer session where two judges would be uh, posing the question and then the entrepreneurs will respond. And then thereafter, one judge would give a sort of a, a final feedback to the entrepreneur and mostly in line with what div criteria are to support them in making a better application when they would want to do that at a later stage. And to now introduce my first uh, enterprise to pitch, I would want to welcome Emilian to, Pitch for Elara Health. 
Thank you, Emilia. Thanks, Alan. Can you uh, see my screen? Yes. Awesome. So uh, I'm Emilia, and I'm the CEO and uh, founder of Filara Health. And um, this is Dr. Boniface, and he runs a small clinic in Kawangare, uh, in the outskirts of Nairobi. And he's trained as a clinical officer. He's not a doctor, as many of those uh, uh, clinic-run um, um, small businesses. And he consults and dispenses medicine tablet by tablet to patients in his low-income community, uh, out of his medical, uh, his small medical center. And when I met him the first time two years ago, I asked him, what would you need, Dr. Boniface, to better do your job? And he immediately answered, I would need a small lab. And this was an aha moment for me. 70% uh, of medical decisions um, require some kind of diagnostic, such as a blood test. But there are 500 million people uh, in Africa today who struggle to access or afford a simple blood test. But, but it's only half of the story. Each year, 3 million people in, in, in low to middle income uh, countries die from a lack of access to care, but 5 million die from low quality healthcare. And at Tilara Health, um, we make diagnostics more affordable, accurate, and accessible in Africa in order to bridge this, this massive diagnostics gap and improve the quality of care. Now, the clean that you see here in the picture is, is, is very similar to any other clinic that we've seen. I'm actually in, in Western Kenya, in, in, a, in the outskirts of a city called Eldoret, and actually I'm visiting one of our potential clients. We've been doing sales since morning. Uh, and this is something which we see in every single <laughs> clinic. So a lot of clinics, very, very fragmented market, all of them very, very small. So, so what we do at Ilara, uh, the way we, we try to bring, uh, to bridge this diagnostics gap is, is, is by harnessing developments in, in what we call the point of care diagnostics. So, this exponential growth of, uh, of the smartphone medicine, I always say the most, our, our smartphone uh, is in our pocket and is the most powerful lab that we all have. Um, so this exponential growth in, in, in smartphone medicine and digital health has brought us those small, affordable and accurate devices to replace this, this bulky device that you see here, which are, which, is, which are super expensive, they're legacy machines, and they're anyways completely out of reach for the facilities uh, we target. So at Ilara Health, we do three things. We partner with those you know, third-party manufacturers of, of diagnostic equipment. We bring those devices into Africa. We uh, distribute this bundle of devices last mile on a 24-month subscription contract, so to make it affordable, because they can't, they can't buy the $25,000 ultrasound, but they can't buy the $2,000 ultrasound either straight. And we place it not in the cities where the mid to upper income people live, but in the outskirts of the cities where 95% of the people live. Um, so in those peri-urban and, and somehow rural clinics and small pharmacies. Um, and, and third thing, we integrate those devices with, uh, with our technology platform. So literally it's an IoT type platform that connects the devices. And we use uh, an electronic medical record as the basis uh, for patient uh, disease management. And you probably know that you know, the, the few major reasons patients visit a doctor uh, or, or a nurse in Africa you know, includes those four, diabetics, cardiovascular diseases, respiratory infections, and, and pregnancy. And our first devices uh, cover them all. And, and we started you now to move from infections and inflammations and reproductive health into, into more complex things, such as, you know, pediatric uh, um, um, cancer. We actually started to, to, to tackle two types of cancers where, where every ounce of precision matters so, and, and targeting areas which are not previously addressed in the facilities we target. And so we create... Uh, new uh, new markets, and and, um, and uh, we believe that. We believe that um, sorry, someone said something. No, just uh, go ahead, please. I, sorry for that interruption. Okay, no worries. Um, so so we believe that you know strong uh, uh, business results for us uh, you know in in uh, in hand hand in hand with with high social impact. So today we're in over two hundred and forty clinics. We open also two two labs. Uh, we've made over seven and a half thousand tests accessible and affordable and reach over 5,000 patients. And, and we're conscious about the contribution we can make on SDG 3, 5, and 8 with a big emphasis on health and well-being. And we, we have very strong growth ambitions. We, in, a, in the upcoming 12 months, we plan to be in over 1,000 clinics, um, have 10 labs operating, uh, 25,000 patients tested, and over 30,000 uh, tests administered. So we're also looking to expand to a second African market uh, this year. And we, we have strong partners on board, 
both on the investor side and on donor donor side, uh, we just closed four and a half uh, uh, million dollar uh, from a mix of venture capital funds and angel investors, and and over one million dollar in grants from Bill and Melinda Gates Foundations and few other grant institutions, and and to further increase our impact, we're looking for partners to yeah. subsidize test. Okay, so so and and to. Uh, to further increase our impact, we're looking for partners to subsidize uh, tests and to raise awareness, uh, to support innovative ways for clinic and, and patient financing, and to collaborate to achieve better health outcomes. And, and we have what it takes to build an amazing business from entrepreneurs to technology to medicine. You know, Maximilian understands the world of AI power diagnostics, Samir understands operations, Sam understands healthcare in West Africa and understand how to build and scale. Uh, distribution businesses in emerging markets. I've been a hands-on uh, company builder, investor, and entrepreneur in Africa uh, for the past 10 years. So just to sum up, our vision as a team is to bring affordable diagnostics to millions of rural Africans to bridge this massive diagnostics gap and improve the quality of care while digitizing, which is very important, the African clinic and plugging in those innovations uh, that make sense. And with your support, we can change health outcomes on a continent with massive needs and massive opportunities. Thank you. And apologize for my screen share, which uh, didn't work properly. Thank you so much, Emilian, for that, that great presentation. Uh, for now, I'd want to introduce one judge uh, to probably give us some question for Emilian. And yeah, Emilian, feel free to just respond to them. Thank you so much, Emilian. This is Aaron Crossett here. Um, and I'm going to be tag teaming this with some other, my other co-judges, I think, I think Joaquin in particular has a couple of questions for you. Um, but I just want to say that this, I mean, this is really a fantastic presentation and I just want to congratulate you and the Alara Health team so far on your work to date. I, um, I appreciate that Alara is tackling such a fundamental problem in emerging markets, the limited access to critical diagnostics, as you explained. Um, and after going through some of your materials, it's, I just really, uh, I appreciate I also appreciate that you have a very thoughtful, uh, the organization has a very thoughtful approach to acquiring customers and manufacturers. So I have a couple more questions around that. Um, but then the last thing I'll, I'll just say generally is that you, the organization seems to be making really great progress. You mentioned you're active in 250 facilities, testing over 5,000 patients. So um, again, just congratulations. It seems like you're, you. you're all making fantastic progress. So Thank you. Um, just kind of, to brass tacks because I only I know we only have a few minutes. Um, just a couple of questions that I thought um, would be helpful to hear your thoughts on, and then also just again things to keep in mind um, as you're pursuing opportunities like Div. Um, so you meant I'm wondering how you how Alara ensures uh, quality or maintains quality assurance when relying on non-specialist facility to deploy the point of care devices. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I mean, that's exactly what, what we try to do through technology to upskill low skilled uh, medical professionals. So in Kenya, there are 15,000 small clinics. Just in the UK, there are thousands. So just to see how fragmented is the, is the industry. I haven't seen in two years of Ilara one single doctor in those clinics. They're just nurses. And as you say, they're low skilled. But by bringing a piece of technology, which is a screen, uh, which can da do a blood test and show the result on the screen, uh, we can solve partially this. Now, what we cannot solve, for example, is placing an ultrasound in the hands of a, of a nurse and, and um, having the nurse to perform the, the pregnancy scan. But what we can do is placing the same probe in the hand of the nurse, connect the probe remotely with a clinician in our office or somewhere else in Nairobi, and doing this remotely. Uh, like this, we can achieve what we need, uh, allowing the clinic to perform the test, but without a specialist, which does not exist or is way too far or lives in a different city. Yeah, that's, that's helpful um, to understand. I guess from a, are you, are you running into issues with connectivity or I imagine that the plat, you know, the platform is reliant on, uh, yeah. you know, consistent 3G network or has that been an yeah. issue? So there's far? 3G. Yeah, there's 3G everywhere. Look, I mean, I had a problem now showing my slides because it's a 3G is not 4G here. But look, all the devices are actually, they, 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 sync, they, they sync offline. Well, they, stay, they can work offline and then sync when they're online. So you don't need connectivity unless for the, for the ultrasound to upload the, the images to the cloud. So in, in most Kenya, there is some kind of 3G, 4G, 3G, or even 2G. We're not very far in rural. We're in the 15 to 25 kilometers outside the main cities. So connectivity for those devices hasn't been an issue. And 65% of those 
15 of, of the 7,000 private clinics are actually in the outskirts of the main cities where there is no connectivity issues. Got it. Thank you. Um, Joaquin, Thank you. do you want to jump in at any point or I can, I can yeah. just... Right. Yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, Before Hakim just stepped in, I would want us to also uh, launch the poll for the session. We have a poll just running through and then we let Hakim. So as you can see on your screen, uh, feel free to respond to the poll and then we'll uh, share probably the feedback later on. But for now, uh, Hakim, just come on and- Great. What's your um, question, please. Sure. I'm curious about the pricing model. It seems like um, you guys use are, are very intentional about the pricing model that you've chosen to make it as accessible as possible to these low capital clinics, um, exactly. which I think is terrific. Um, but uh, I'm curious about whether you guys have experimented at all with trial periods, um, you know, being that it's a 24 month subscription, you know, are, are you dealing with apprehension of people signing on to that long a commitment? No, sure, and that's, that's, a, that's a great question. The pricing is one of the big, the reason there is no diagnostics here is be, because the, the, the big labs are too expensive. But uh, well, I always say the price of a, la, of a, of a blood test in Nairobi is as expensive. A, a price of a lab test in Nairobi is as expensive as in Lo London or, or New York. Um, so what we do here, we bring devices in which, first of all, we know that we can potentially reduce that, that cost by two or three times. Uh, but also we test them uh, for two to three months. So every device that we bring in our, in our bundle, we have seven today, we're gonna bring another 10 this year. Every device we tested for two or three months in the facilities from a pricing perspective to understand how much can the clinic charge? How much can we charge the clinic to make it affordable? That's great. Um, and uh, apologies if this was made clear in the presentation, I just totally overlooked it. But do you have the clinic staff, like the, the same providers that are, you know, doing, uh, say, primary care uh, checkups for, for patients? Are those the same people that are operating the diagnostics, maybe with the exception of the ultrasound? So yep. you're training them yep. on the usage of the seven to 10 devices that, that you guys uh, deploy? Uh, exactly. We train them. We train them technically, so they can move. Uh, they, they can read a. They can read a cholesterol or a lipid profile test on a, on the screen. Uh, they can read an HB. They can read an hemoglobin A one C. Uh, we train them how to use technical devices, but we can't tell, train them how to perform an ultrasound. And that's where we place the tele, telehealth platform uh, for the ultrasound. For the we have an ENT camera. We have an ophthalmology kit as well, where we use remote uh, clinicians um, um, and optimizing their utilization. I mean, if you see here, that's, that's a typical clinic. I'm not sure if you see on your screen. That's the typical clinic where we are, small facility in kind of semi-rural area, uh, you know, very, very few patients um, living around and with one nurse. It's a one nurse run facility. Well, I have a couple of, couple more questions. Are we still okay on time, Alan? I think. Please go ahead, Aaron. Um, so you, so something I'm wondering about your customer acquisition is, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about or paint a better picture of what Alara looks for in potential providers. So the what does Alara, the B2B Salesforce, look for um, in you know when they're doing quality checks and their initial sure. testing? Sure. So we have about 25 people in the fields from the, in the sales team, and another another 10 on after sales. Okay, there, there are 15,000 providers. We look we, we target for now some of the public, but mostly the, the half, the 7,000 small private providers. There are way too many. The reality, you know, 80% of them are way too small. So what we do, we go door to door, like I'm doing today, uh, spend half an hour with the clinician, ask them 40 questions uh, to understand whether or not they have enough patient flow and they can make, they, if we place a device there, they can use properly the device to serve the community, but in the same time make money for themselves because pro profitability for those clients, which make three to three to four thousand dollars a month, is very important. They need to make money at the, at the end of the month to pay their rent and pay their staff. So out of those, after we we ask those questions, we decide whether or not, whether or not that's a good clinic for us, and then we place a device. And and you know, that, in, interesting enough, number one thing which makes or breaks a business in a clinic is actually the the nurse entrepreneur. If the nurse is super entrepreneurial, like I've seen three today, it's, it's, gonna, it's usually working. If the nurse is a good nurse, but does not have the skills of running a business a clinic, it usually doesn't work. And then obviously it's patient flow, position of the clinic, you know, cleanless inside. There are not other, other criteria uh, which count in our credit assessment. 
but it's a very, very door to door, you know, uh, in, you know, very heavy operational interaction with those clinics. Yeah, that's, that's helpful. Um, so it looks like, and Alan, correct me if I'm wrong, but it looks like we're down to the last couple of minutes. So I can provide sort of my general, um, my general takeaways, but again, I just want to, I just want to thank you and just congratulate sure. you for the progress your team has made thus far. Yeah. Clap. Uh, it, you, it's really just very impressive and inspiring. A couple of things, a couple of other questions that um, I didn't have a chance to ask, but I think would be helpful to keep in mind as, again, as you're thinking about potentially applying to DIV or other similar um, funding mechanisms. So um, one is that I think it would be helpful to better understand, I think you've made a very clear case for the problem and you have made a very clear, um, you, very, you clearly articulated the Alara's model. I think it would be helpful to understand in terms of impact how providers are using Alara's diagnostic results, right? So there's clearly this this gap and this lack of, an, uh, of accessible and affordable diagnostic care, which is sort of the first order issue. And then the second order issue is like, how are people actually using those diagnostics? So um, I think it's just important to keep in mind as you're, you're thinking about the ultimate impact of Alara and the goal to ultimately you know, improve health outcomes. Um, something else that I'm, I'd be curious to better understand um, is just how you're, you know, you're making really great progress in Kenya, and I'm curious how you're thinking about expansion. You mentioned, um, or some of your materials mentioned, potentially looking into expansion into a second uh, African market. Yeah. So I'm wondering how you're thinking about that um, relative, you know, the trade-offs of that as opposed to sort of penetrating the Kenyan market deeper. So there are two types of markets in Africa. So similar to Kenya, where it's a, still a door-to-door, -door, similar problems. Uh, I would say Uganda, Tanzania, Ethiopia, uh, as well as West Africa, Nigeria, and Ghana, which are also highly private and highly out of pocket because people pay out of their pocket. There's no insurance. And there are markets where there is, a, which are slightly more advanced, like South Africa and Egypt, which have a slightly bigger insurance penetration, where we we can work, we can bring a payer. The other really really important thing in this business is to bring a payer. Uh, to increase this 2% and its sewer penetration towards 10%. And that's where, that's, that's the, the way we tackle the, the two other markets we look now is actually bringing payers into, the, into this all uh, equation. And then one last final uh, comment or question or something that um, I think would be helpful to have an, an understanding of, again, when, uh, you know, if you decide to pursue DIV or other opportunities is, um, so I asked about customer acquisition on the manufacturer acquisition, um, you talked a little bit about in some of your materials that you, you sent over earlier that the, the limited number of FDA approved commercially available diagnostic devices is a, um, that, that's a key constraint to Alara. And so I'm wondering, it seems like it's probably going to be a more of a binding constraint down the road, but I'm just want, wondering sort of how you're thinking about that. Um, especially, you know, as you're pursuing yeah. other expansion opportunities. This is growing exponential. I think that's, that's interesting is that today, I mean, when we started Ilara, there were maybe 15 companies, you know, there, there, there are many companies manufacturing digital devices. That question is a lot of them are completely out of reach in terms of price or in terms of price per test. So we're limited in number of manufacturers, which are right. usually the, you know, $500 million startup sitting in New York. They're not the G's and the, the Philipses of the world. Um, but, but the good news is that this pool, of, this pool of companies is exponentially increasing. So today there are hundreds. A year ago, there are 50 and then before there's no one. So I, 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 we look at as, as a train that we catch today uh, and, and we piggyback on that growth in the technology and then and the, the, the smartphone medicine. And we build relationships at a founder level early enough, even before FDA approval of those devices, go through the process with the manufacturer. And then when that's done, we bring the device into Kenya and test it. I see. That's really helpful. And I think we're at time. So I just want to say again, thank you so much, uh, Emilian. Thank you so much. And, um, and I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Really appreciate cool. it. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you, Emilian, for your time too. Uh, now to introduce our next entrepreneur for the day, I would like to introduce Nazir from uh, Ghana, presenting for us People's Pension Trust, an enterprise which focuses on informal sector workers with the aim of solving the challenge of saving for retirement. And over to you, Sakib, so that you can share your screen and present. Uh, thank you, Alan. Thank you, everyone. Um, I will switch to the presentation. Yes, Alan, you, you can see my presentation? Yes, I can see your presentation. Okay. Great, thank you everyone. So my name is Sakib, I'm CEO of People's Pension Trust. Um, 
and I'd like to present you our solution today. Uh, Ghana has one, uh, 13 million informal workers. Uh, the population of Ghana is 30 million. Um, if you set a working age of half, that would be 15 million workers. Only 2 million workers are formally employed. The remaining 13 million are informal workers. I don't think they are unemployed. I think they are informally employed, perhaps underemployed, but definitely employed for themselves and generating revenue. These are farmers, traders, construction workers, hawkers, and sometimes even uh, computer engineers and graphic designers and maybe architects on the high level who work for themselves. But for sure, the informal economy is huge and you can scale this across West Africa. West Africa has an estimated 400 million workers and globally they're over a billion. The reality, unfortunately, is that the majority of these will end up in old age poverty. A people's Pension stepped in to help solve this crisis by providing pensions and other financial services to informal workers in order to reduce old age poverty and to provide resilience in income generation. It is my pleasure to present our solution which allows anyone to create a pension account with us and then save any amount, no matter how small, at any time of their convenience. Uh, I would like to introduce Justina, one of our customers, uh, who is a 45 year old trader at Makola, one of the busiest markets here in Ghana. And like many other uh, such persons, uh, her retirement plan was to depend on her children. Uh, two years ago, Justina opened, uh, signed up to our pension scheme. And despite the daily struggle to make ends meet, she's been putting aside $4 every week into her pension account. Justina has also in the past taken advantage of the withdrawal option uh, on the account to invest and grow in her business and is also grateful to have the built-in life insurance cover. Uh, we're also exploring, uh, let, let me tell you a little bit about our product. So at the core of it is, is the pension product, which you only um, receive when you retire. Uh, by law, and we are a regulated entity, regulated by the National Pensions Regulatory Authority, we're allowed to give back on, the, on this tier three, uh, a voluntary uh, pension product, we're allowd to give out 50% uh, of the contribution at any point as savings. What we've also built in partnership with uh, partner banks is the capability to offer that saving components as security in order for the bank to perhaps give you three or four times that savings amount. And, and that's a fantastic opportunity for everyone. We've also layered on a life income product automatically. So everyone who contributes with us receives uh, in the event of, or their beneficial receive in the event of that situation, four times the last one year's contribution as a life insurance uh, payment. We're now working on, on what I like to call income insurance. And, and for me, the, the situation is that um, uh, perhaps if someone is, is ill or unable to work, what happens to them during that time? That might be a situation where they're selling off assets and digging deeper into poverty. And so if we can, and this is something we're working on right now with some insurance companies, offer them some level of income insurance for that period when they're ill or unable to work, they have some income to depend on. Another very critical component is, is upscaling. And this is where we're working with the various groups that we're engaged in. We're, we're working very closely with market women groups, farmer groups, with the union of informal workers to help come up with training programs and financial literacy programs to upskill those workers so that the workers could hopefully build a better life for themselves. Of course, it's in our benefit because they would contribute more to us, but you can imagine how this would help impact many people. We're also working on a value added services basis where we help uh, um, provide additional tools uh, such as um, uh, an app for record keeping. I see I'm running out of time, so I, I'll speed along. <laughs> you know. um, um, we, we're looking to, there are many other members like Justina who are able to register, contribute, and withdraw through the use of mobile money and mobile phones via our easy USSD app. Justina also recently switched from cash payments to automatic deductions on mobile money, which has made life so much easier for her. Uh, as we don't want to leave anyone behind, our agents also use our USSD app to record and receive cash from uh, people who do not have phones or mobile money. We send out regular SMSs for every transaction, and we're now rolling out voice receipts for those who are illiterate and who, uh, and also building a mobile app for the digitally savvy. 
COVID-19 has further amplified the need to move from high touch to high digital for members like Justine. And the opportunity really is to transcend from high touch to high tech where all interactions can be digital. Uh, we're investing heavily in, in new innovations through behavioral science, human-centered design, data analytics, and artificial intelligence. And this will help us to develop innovative financial products that will meet the needs and aspirations of our customers. We're also utilizing partnerships with banks and telcos to scale through these learnings and innovation. This is a crisis and an opportunity that we can all get involved in. Um, let me tell you a little bit about our impact. We currently have about 45,000 members. 35% uh, of them are active and have, are actively contributing on a regular basis. Uh, we've seen also that out of the active members, 60% are women. And this shows us that women are more active savers. Uh, the profile of our customers today is mostly taxi drivers, cocoa farmers, market traders, and poultry farmers. The average contribution amount is around $3.50 in, in, of course, local currency. And the withdrawal amount is around $60. Uh, and then our total AUM, the assets on the management for us is $1.25 million. And our revenue is a factor of the AUM that we manage. That's the only commission we earn. Uh, and that is highly regulated by the NPRA. We work very closely with the custodian bank and with the fund manager. So the funds are very secure uh, and, and everyone shares a little bit of that revenue that is generated. Um, next steps, we're looking to raise about $20 million later in the year in order to expand globally over the next five years. We're looking closely at the West African market, but also at other areas. Uh, and we're doing some feasibility on the next few markets that we would like to be involved in. Uh, some of our current investors have been uh, F FSDAI through DFID, Cordate, Sorensen Impact Foundation, AHL. NVU was one of our founding organizations. The FMO, the Dutch Development Bank, has been involved with us with giving us grant money and helping us with other research. CGAP has also been very helpful from the World Bank in, in helping us conduct research into customer engagement. And our latest fundraiser, uh, our latest investor is uh, the DRK Foundation. Uh, and FutureX is, a, is my personal investment vehicle. I'm also one of the shareholders in the company. Um, our team is very solid. I, I, I have 20, personally 20 years experience in running technology companies. My chief operating officer, Kofi Poli, has over 15 years experience in the pension sector. Uh, our head of communications is, is very strong in communications. Samuel, our CFO, has 20 years of experience. Uh, and, and Kanini from the DRK board, of course, comes with a wealth of experience. And we have a strong team of 20 other employees and about 25 agents on the ground, also helping us um, roll out our products. So thank you for your time. Um, this is our USSD um, D, uh, QR code. It might not work where you are, but it's very helpful for us here in Ghana. So thank you for your time. I hope I didn't rush through it too much and I'm happy to take on your questions and any feedback at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Sakib, for the presentation. Not be standing there. So much time you took, but that's fine. Uh, before we get to the question point, I would want us to also run the question, the poll, uh, to highlight some of the feedback from the participants on your presentation. Okay, Alan, whilst we wait for the feedback from the poll that you're running, I guess, as lead judge on uh, people's pension, I would like to lead the conversation with my other judges who can provide feedback to uh, Sakip as to how to scale this business, both in Ghana and across the region. But let me uh, start by saying that uh, people's pension is providing to the informal uh, uh, space. It's a very important one. And it's important because he may probably have underestimated the informal uh, uh, sector in Ghana. We think it's estimated to over 70% of the working force. And these are farmers, cocoa farmers, drivers, dr uh, uh, market women, and so many other people who are earning income and sometimes are neglected because the pension fund that we have in Ghana only caters for those who work for bank still coast mining and the formal sector. So for me, I think the problem is huge 
the solution is innovative. The market opportunity is uh, big. It's something we can scale both in Ghana and across the region and so on. So the impact is huge. I think I'm from the northern part of Ghana. And I wondered maybe if you had come earlier before uh, my father passed, maybe he would have had a more decent life before he passed whilst I was in the position, whilst I was not in the position to provide him income support in his old age. I have four questions. I will start with two. My fellow uh, uh, judges will uh, uh, ask the others and I'll conclude with the two. But as you mentioned, your business model is an AUM game because you take a percentage of the AUM you are managing 2.5% of the AUM. And therefore, I wonder, particularly the scheme being voluntary, how do you ensure that the scalability and stickiness and contribution? Great. Um, thank you, Godfrey. Thank you very much. The, the comment you made before, I'll quickly touch on that. Actually, we couldn't have done this before. So we could not have helped your father, unfortunately, because technology wasn't there before. And the reason why we're able to do it now is, and, and to make it profitable, and, and I'm going to your question about AUM, is exactly because of technology, because of mobile phones and mobile money. That is a game changer for us. And you are right, it is purely a numbers game. So we are a registered pension company. We do play in the formal sector also. We do have corporate customers. But our focus is the informal sector. And you're right, our current business plan shows break even in 2025. Okay, and we're able to achieve scale through two things through technology. The agents on the ground are expensive, to be honest, and they're there just so that we don't leave anyone behind. Okay, but our real engagement with customers is through technology. And this is why we're investing heavily in technology, in, in, the, QR, in the QR codes, the USSD codes, the smart apps coming up in data analytics, in, uh, in behavioral science, okay? And then going forward into apps, because today, to be honest, a lot of people are, are have smartphones and will have smart apps. And then we are investing heavily this year in, in um, customer engagement. And that is a, um, a referral program and a, uh, an incentive program, okay? So we have to think more like a telco than a, a pension company. We have to think like, you know, and even try and do a bit of gaming, a bit of gamification of the product. And a one big change for us has been the one-time approval. Okay, the fact that we're able to get people to sign up one time. Okay, so you sign up and you agree on a recurring payment and automatically from the next time we deduct that. We don't need to ask you for your PIN anymore. And that is a game changer for us. So that, that's the way we're looking to scale up. Today, we have 45,000 customers. We're hoping to end the year with 110,000 customers, okay? And we have all kinds of customers, our partnerships with Airtel Tigo. And I'm not just talking about mobile money. We have a partnership with Airtel Tigo where they present us as their white labeled pension uh, uh, company to their subscribers. We have a partnership with Vodafone as Easy Pension. We're launching a partnership with Society General with their Yap brand and a partnership with Access Bank uh, and then we also have a partnership with UNIWA, the Union of Informal Workers Association. So we're looking to scale up with, with a lot of organizations or customers who have products, but not pension. We have pension, but not customers. And this is where we're willing to share revenue and, and, and to, to offer value to our customers. So we are already engaging on partnerships with rural banks and microfinance institutions who can channel their customers through to us for pension. And that's what we are hoping that in, in, in 2025 we will be at the break-even point. Because yes, you are right, the AUM is small. It's not even 2.5% uh, because that 2.5% is shared between ourselves, the regulator, the fund manager, and the custodian bank. So our share is actually 1.33%, but we're very lucky our fund manager data bank has offered to waive off the charges in order for customer engagement. And we are having the same discussions with our custodian bank and the regulator in promoting informal pensions is also looking to waive off their charges so that we can focus on customer acquisition and, and growth. Yeah, no, thank you very much. And I'll still stick to uh, scaling up and uh, customer acquisition because 
AUM is a customer acquisition game. It has to be with people who have uh, uh, subscribed and they are religious with their contribution, just like I cannot skip my SNIT pension scheme. How are you exploring partnerships with the likes of government? Because I know in the cocoa sector that employs about 400,000 farmers, where you can pass through government to ensure that there is a government contribution because the cocoa industry is a big industry in Ghana, and therefore they have to have skin in the game. The other piece is, you know, instead of uh, your agents, like you said, being on the ground trying to acquire customers, that is very expensive. Through the driver union, for instance, even Uber, you probably have a partnership with Uber and it's just, you know, every month, whatever amount the person has said, I am going to be able to contribute is deducted because they are driving and so on. Versus, I know market women are very important, but how do we ensure that a, a religious commitment to making sure that they, so, but I will say stick with partnerships, particularly the government and some of the associations that could really make this mandatory rather than voluntary. Uh, perfectly right. So that's exactly the route we're taking. So like I said, we have a partnership with UNIWA, the Union of Informal Workers under the TUC. Okay, we have a partnership with the GPRTU. Uh, we are exploring partnership with Uber where, you know, the QR code I showed, you know, so for example, one product we are coming up with is for the driver to post that QR code on his car. So instead of giving him a tip in cash, you could tip straight into his pension. Uh, we've launched another product called iCare where you subscribe on behalf of, let's say your domestic worker or someone you care about. You can imagine how many domestic workers there are in the market. You know, these are drivers, nannies, cooks, uh, security guards. And so if you could sign up and start contributing towards their pension so that then they also learn about it and we encourage them also to save up towards it. So exactly all the initiatives you are, you are talking about. The one point where I will differ with you is on engagement with government. Unfortunately, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm quite skeptical about government initiatives. They, they take long, they have their own ideas, they don't really think through everything properly. And so I prefer the private sector route. And my philosophy is to bend over backwards to help anybody who wants to work with us. Uh, and unfortunately, you know, government recently announced their own scheme for cocoa farmers, which actually impacted us because our cocoa farmers stopped then contributing with us but the government is yet to announce anything further. So I prefer not to wait on governments. I, I, I'm happy to run on my own. If government sees value in us, we will engage with them. But unfortunately, I, I think sometimes the politics is too much. And I prefer, I have shareholders and I'm a shareholder. I want to see a return for myself. I want to see the real value if my customers are engaging with me. And it's amazing. I see people contributing automatically on Sundays. If, you know, what does it take for someone on a Sunday to contribute $2 to their pension? For me, that's a real success. And that's the segment we want to focus in. Those who appreciate the value we bring to the table and are willing to work with us, we are all willing to bend over backwards to work with such segments. Thank you so much, Sakib. And uh, just so before I introduce Godfrey, probably for the next question, I would probably recommend you just give a general feedback as we close with the people's pension because we are somehow behind in time. All other judges, you can always share your questions or your feedback and we'll direct them to Sakib later on, which would be helpful uh, whenever we'll be coming on to make the application for DIV. For now, maybe just give us your last comment, Godfrey, and then we move to the next presenter for the day. Okay, so I will be quick. I think uh, I would have wanted him to answer the question of the negative perception of fund managers in Ghana following the collapse of uh, financial institutions and all of that. But let him say, this solution is needed in the market. The market opportunity is huge. The impact on vulnerable people is important. Can you imagine being a taxi driver driving for 30 years and your waste gives in and you come back home and you have nothing to fall on. But I think Sakib understands the business. It is all an AUM game, AUM, AUM. 
make sure you have more people contributing for it and they are sticky, their contribution is regular because what will make this business succeed is the 1.3% of the AUM they will earn to manage the infrastructure, the people that are on their payroll and operating expenses. But I think this is needed in Ghana, is needed in Nigeria, is needed in Kenya, is needed in Uganda. And you guys have to have a tough skin. I agree with you. Governments are not the way to build businesses, but don't shy away as well if there are any innovative solutions that will build your customer base. But I'm impressed with what you guys have done and good luck. Thank, thank you, you so you. much, Godfrey. Thank you. Really very appreciate the relevant feedback. Thank you. And thank you, Sakib, too, for taking your time to present to this panel. We will share with you any other feedback remaining and looking forward to a great time going forward. To present next is Muzalema Mwanza, a co-founder of Safe Motherhood Alliance, based in Zambia, a health startup established with the goal to reduce maternal and infant mortality through improved care. Muzalema, please go ahead. Thank you, Alan, and it's a pleasure to be here. Okay, thank you. Good, I'm the co-founder of Safe Motherhood. Sarah's eight months pregnant, and in a couple of weeks' time, a traditional birth attendant will cut her umbilical cord with a rusty blade and apply toothpaste for quick healing. For Sarah and her baby, there is no such thing as a routine pregnancy. Every year, more than 300,000 women and 2.7 million babies die during the brief window period between a baby's birth and a baby's first month. The major pain points are lack of access to sterile supplies, lack of access to medical personnel, distances to the nearest health facilities, and the high cost. With 1.2 million annual births per year in Zambia, scaling up to 20 million annual births per year in Southern Africa, we find that 63% of all births are home births away from a medical facility because of this. I know of this because it happened to me three and a half years ago when I was pregnant myself and the hospital asked me to provide my own birth materials. No scalpel blade, no delivery mat, no gloves. I was fortunate I could afford it and I had a healthy son, but I found it unacceptable that one in 13 babies and one in 20 mothers were affected because of this. Our solution at Safe Motherhood Alliance is at four parts. We're able to distribute conveniently low cost products to pregnant women in low income communities and rural areas with our flagship products called the baby delivery kit that contains all the essential items that a woman requires at childbirth to ensure her and her baby are safe. We also provide cost-effective solutions with our products that represent a 60% reduction in cost of supplies. This ensures that a mother is not sent back with our supplies. We, uh, we also offer a complete style solution in reducing infections by 90% during home births. Our products are also culturally appropriate, delivered by trusted community members who are called traditional birth attendants. These are community and village midwives who assist women to give birth outside of a health facility due to lack of medical personnel. During our pilot, we were given a worst performing clinic in our location in Zambia with a sample size of 5,000 pregnant women. What we saw was a 100% success rate with no mother or newborn deaths recorded. And we saw a 5% increase in clinic and central visits. The outcomes of this led to the Ministry of Health integrating our baby delivery kit model into their mother and child health programs, leading to a 15% increase in usage of sterile tools by traditional birth attendants for home births. So we provide an end-to-end -end solution by, by manufacturing the baby delivery kits and also due to the high demand and shortages in global supply chains, we have started manufacturing some of the items ourselves like the biodegradable sanitary pads. We also distribute um, through our traditional birth attendants that we also train on safe birth practices and they become our distribution agents, earning them an additional income stream of that of our baby kits and other products. To the consumers, we provide a cost reduction of 30 to 50% less than other alternatives or options and also provide quality assurance for safe delivery regardless of whether they do it from a facility birth or a home birth. We also partner with a network of under-resourced health facilities that provide maternal health services 
receiving a pipeline of cuts tested into the value chain. We're giving more women the. In 2019 and 2020, SMA, Safe Mother Alliance, successfully launched our operations, and we've seen rapid expansion that's been achievable over the last years with 5,000 baby delivery kits delivered in 2019. And last year we saw 25,000 baby delivery kits delivered to 25,000 pregnant mothers. We, we foresee an increase to 100,000 mothers who will be served annually starting from 2023. The impact that we have currently is we have been able to distribute 20,000 baby delivery kits. We are currently working in 10 health facilities through our partnership with the Ministry of Health. We've been able to train 100 traditional birth attendants who also work as distribution agents, earning a commission of every kit that they sell. This has directly impacted 150 people from families as a result of improved health care because of safe delivery of a mother. Through our one-to-one -one design tool, we have been impacted both mother and newborn, seeing 40,000 pregnant women and uh, newborns that have had healthy outcomes. And we've created 50 new jobs for distribution agents. Through our, bio, through our manufacture of biodegradable sanitary pads, we've been able to save 5,300 kilograms of environmental waste that would otherwise have rotted in banana fields. Our team comprises of myself. I am a civil engineer with over 10 years experience and working in rural communities, focusing on education and gender empowerment. Mabel is a trained counselor who works with traditional birth attendants, focusing on behavioral change and transforming communities. Mr. Kapenda has several years of experience and he's the programs manager in our, in our company. Dr. Finip Tima Khan is development in logistics, supply chain delivery and product development. Join us at Save Mother Alliance as we are ensuring that pregnancy is not a dangerous time for any woman in Africa. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mzalema, notwithstanding so many connection challenges, but we are able to understand your presentation. Thank you so much. I would like to introduce one of the judges to come on and just give a, a question. Or before that, maybe first, let's have a poll, our third poll for the day. And then I'll ask one of the judges to ask any question before Sarah comes with the feedback. Yeah, and as Alan is um, launching the poll, uh, I just want to say thank you so much for the amazing work that you're that you're doing and the pitch that you just shared. Um, and I appreciate you sharing your story um, about your birth as well as Sarah's, and it really put the the human element to this because we know how important it is to have. Um, safe birth and and you know and so um, thank you for your pitch and for the amazing work that you're doing. Uh, the it was really helpful and inspiring to better understand both what you've accomplished and then also your big plans for growth. Um, and so I think as we're Alan, if, if we're getting the poll launched, uh, I, I have two kind of themes to my questions, and just, this is really let's continue with the uh, questions. Okay. Um, the two themes to some of my questions are as I think about the div criteria and you know what were uh, what are the, some of the things that um, development innovation ventures values as we want to partner with companies like yourself and the first theme is really around growth like scale how are you thinking about scale and then the second is around impact and I'll ask Erin um, when we get to that question to to come in with some of her questions um, so. You know, in a short time, you've had a lot of traction, which is really inspiring and, and amazing. And you've worked with, you know, 30,000 mothers. Um, you've been able to partner with the ministries of health based on um, a successful pilot, which is huge. And as you think about your aspirations of being able to um, scale across Zambia to, to get across to those 10 provinces, how, how are you thinking about that scale? How are you thinking about that growth? Thank you so much for the question, Sarah. Um, really, um, when we look at growth for a Safe Motherhood Alliance, what we value is ensuring that every mother and newborn has healthy outcomes, as well as traditional birth attendants, um, ensuring that they are also trained, which is why they are part of our business model. Um, we sell directly to pregnant women. We also sell to the traditional birth attendants who then become our distribution agents. Um, and we also sell directly to the clinics and health facilities in the country. Um, so we're already generating a modest profit, but we're really looking to accelerate profitability in 2022. 
by launching our own manufacturing facility this year. Um, by doing this, we'll be able to bring the production cost and packaging of the kit down and significantly boost productivity and profitability as well. Um, in 2023, we're targeting an earned income of 967,000 US dollars, you know, looking at a gross margin of 52% and operating margins of 38%. This will clearly put us on a path um, for both self-funding growth and sustainability. And to be able to do this, we're looking at partnering with um, local organizations and organizations around the region. Unfortunately, in Zambia and most countries um, around Zambia materials for their, you know, for childbirth and the issue with health facilities not having adequate supplies and requesting women to bring their own um, supplies. And what, what I found to be, you know, um, challenge really was, you know, making women either go back or asking them to wait for their partners or either of the family members to bring, you know, either it would be it sterile gloves or, you know, um, a scalpel blade. So my question is, in maternal health care, why are women asked to bring their own birth materials? It's almost as though, you know, you go for an operation for a heart condition and bring your own pacemaker as well. Otherwise, you won't be attended to. So that's what we're also trying to make sure we, 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 we are also trying to work with government to ensure that, you know, um, advocating for policies that are able to help women have healthy births, as well as certifying traditional birth attendants. These are the backbones of most communities because you know we don't have 24 hour care. Um, we don't have ambulance systems. That's why we see such a huge increase of 64% um, being home births outside of a health facility. And these women give, you know, assist without, you know, wearing the proper sterile um, equipment, you know, no gloves. And then, you know, two weeks later, this woman gets an infection and the baby has sepsis and the doctors don't know how to help her because the birth happened outside of a health facility. She has no record at all. So how do they start even, you know, being able to assist her? So the, our first really mission is ensuring women, you know, demand the, their right to give birth in a health facility and not be afraid to be chased away. And this is why you've seen, you know, this huge um, growth for us, because then when women have the the kit is very convenient for them. They don't have to make 10 to 20 stops looking for, you know, gloves, which they find either very expensive, something that's, you know, packed in a bag and you know. Sarah, maybe before you ask the next question or so, Muzalema, you can just probably turn off your camera so that you don't get static or you lose it sometimes. Okay. Sarah, yes, go ahead, please. Amazing. And um, I'll, I'll ask Erin to come in with her second question, but I just want to say, um, like, thank you so much for walking through why you see, have seen such a rapid growth and increase in demand for your for your product and for your services. It's very clear that there is a market need um, and it's very clear that you're helping um, women's lives and their families' lives, which is really incredible. Um, and so Aaron, I'll, I'll turn it over to you to ask some of your questions. Yeah, sure. Same. Thanks, Aaron. Thank you so much, Ms. Lima. Again, that, yeah, as Sarah said, that this is very both very inspiring presentation and also um, it's just amazing to see the amount of traction that you've been getting um, and the progress you've made. So just congratulations. Um, so like Sarah mentioned, I just have a, my question is kind of surrounding the impact and how you're thinking about measuring the impact of the kits on um, maternal and infant health outcomes. Again, you know, one of DIV's core criteria is um, demonstrating evidence of impact. And so um, I'm just wondering, you know, how, how you're thinking about it on an ongoing basis, um, you know, how to demonstrate uh, that, you know, the kit provides, um, you know, improves health outcomes for both, you know, women, pregnant women and, uh, and infants over and above sort of the usual care that they would otherwise have access to. It was a bit of static, but I hope I got, you know, um, your question. Um, so, you know, some of what we're also looking at doing um, going forward is, uh, you know, equipping the traditional birth attendants with the necessary tools to also collect data. Because what we've realized um, is it's one thing to equip a woman with a kit, but it's another thing to ensure that she uses the kit, especially during childbirth. And to be able to do this, we've realized that, you know, the voice of women, especially in terms of demanding you know, quality care, um, sometimes, especially if, the, you know, the families are not involved in our 
um, in our, you know, in our conversations, th this leads to a lot of issues with either the mother-in-law or the husbands not allowing her to access this quality care. So with looking at going forward, we are involving more families, we're involving the husbands and the partners, as well as equipping the TBAs with mobile tools to be able to collect data. Um, by doing this, what we wanna do is to also be sending push notifications to the pregnant women you know, through USSD, because this is something that's very common with 90% penetration in Zambia. Um, we know that you know, once women are able to you know, access information, they then will be able to use it. We've had women who've given birth, you know, had four children at, you know, during a home birth, and now she's on her fifth pregnancy, and now she realizes how dangerous it was to actually give birth from home because all of a sudden she's got high blood pressure, she's got preeclampsia, you know, and, and she, this is something she never realized. Um, so really looking at also partnering and working with the Ministry of Health to be able to ensure that we all, we have healthy outcomes as well, because what we've realized is, you know, Ministry of Health also have low resource um, clinics and health facilities that either lack medical personnel or even just, you know, lack basic, um, goes has a breach or complicating her pregnancy. Sorry, was I cutting out, Alan? It's, but You're on yeah, mute. Okay. Just, bit, but just go ahead and finish up on there. So I'll That's just yeah, I'll just wrap it up. So what I wanted to say is, if the woman knows in you know in good time of you know whether she has a breach or whether you know her pregnancy is is a dangerous pregnancy, she is then able to move to the nearest town, which you know, has a bigger hospital to be able to assist her, which is why our work is mainly focused in low income communities and in rural areas. And I'll just give you a quick fact is, you know, when we began, I thought the primary, primary our work would be focused you know, in the most rural parts of Zambia, but we're actually very active in the capital city, Lusaka as well, where we see a number of you know, um, home deliveries as well. Um, so you know, for us, it's pushing for facility births to ensure that women have healthy outcomes, as well as adding technology to it, to ensure we're able to collect the data and give this to the Ministry of Health and the government and advocate for policies that ensure that you know, pregnant mothers do not have to deal with these issues again. Something that's been brought to the table is, you know, they're introducing a, a health bill and we're hoping to propose to them that with the health bill for pregnant women, she would be able to have you know, a kit, um, a kit voucher so that when she goes to a clinic, she is not sent back. Our five-year plan is to ensure that the kit, we're able to, to retail it at less than $5, ensuring we're able to reach our target populations. Um, so in a nutshell, that's, that's my answer. Thank you so much for that, Ms. Oyama. Thank you. Amazing, and I'll, I'll just wrap up this section. I just wanna say, um, inspiring um and i'm and i can't wait to see in the coming years the outcomes that you're going to be able to achieve and keep achieving and keep impacting women's lives and their um, their babies lives and so i think as we think about development innovation ventures and some of the criteria that we really care about you've hit on a number of them in in this conversation one is health outcomes right how can we ensure that we have clear health outcomes um, with the kit deliveries and really making sure that the um, the safe births are achieved, um, both for the infant and for the mother. And I think the second theme that we really care about is pathways for scale. Um, as you're thinking about, like one of the aspirations that Div has is to be able to work with innovators that are able to reach millions of people. And, and one of the things that we've talked about here in this conversation is around um, your partner um, with the Ministry of Health of Zambia, you know, how you're thinking about your distribution models. And so the theme of scale and growth is something that uh, Div really cares about as we think about the tiered funding model that, that we have. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Alan um, for the next innovator. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Muzalema, and thank you, Sarah, for emphasizing on the very critical criteria that DIV are looking for, for in the application and just guiding Muzalema through that. So to introduce to us the last uh, pitch for the day is called up, uh, and Nemeka will be the one presenting, co-founder of the uh, Agri-Clean Energy Enterprise with vision to reduce post-harvest loss in Nigeria and providing cold storage to key points along this food supply chain. Thank you, Nemeka, and go ahead and present. Maybe. Thank, thank you very much, Alan. I hope everyone can hear me. 
Uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening from wherever you are uh, joining this uh, pitch presentation from. Over the next five minutes, I'll be talking about our work, uh, Code Hubs uh, providing solar powered cold storage. But real quickly, as an introduction, my name is Namiki Kewon. I'm a farmer, a radio presenter, and a social entrepreneur. I founded my first venture, the Smallholders Foundation, in 2003 as a nonprofit that uh, uses educational radio programs to improve the livelihood of rural smallholder farmers. And the flagship of that organization was a community radio station, the Smallholder Farmers Rural Radio. I established this radio station in 2007, and I spent 30% of my time at the studio talking about agriculture and receiving listener responses. And the other 70% I spent in the field, uh, sitting down with farmers and standing up with them to identify challenges and opportunities within the agricultural space. And it was in the course of my travels through the length and breadth of Nigeria that I identified the problem of food spoilage. And the statistics says 45% of food uh, spoils due to lack of cold storage at key points along the food supply chain. And this problem affects 93 million smallholder farmers who lose 25% of their income, but also reduces the net availability of high quality nutritious food for local consumption. So when you travel along Nigerian highways, you see food being dumped on the roadside by producers, by the farmers, because there is no storage infrastructure that should actually hold the food. You know, when food is wasted, spoils, and nobody consumes it, all the resources that went into that production, the water, uh, fertilizer, the weeding, and so on, is actually lost. And it means there is no need to actually to have stepped out to produce that food. We all understand that refrigeration can be used to extend the shelf life of food. But refrigeration presently doesn't exist in Nigerian market because the grids are not capable to deliver reliable energy. And most of the equipment is so expensive for the average smallholder farmer to actually afford. So in 2015, I founded Code Hubs as a company that designs builds, commissions, and operates these 100% solar-powered working cold rooms. These cold rooms are specially designed for installation in farm clusters, horticultural produce aggregation centers, and also in outdoor food markets. But aside deploying technology to be used to extend the shelf life of food, what Code Up does is to offer education around post-service management to smallholder farmers, the best practice in harvesting fresh fruit and vegetables, to the financial gain of having high quality food available for consumption and for sale to the public. But you know, the ultimate goal of what Code Up does is to extend the shelf life of food from two to 21 days. Aside that, we also have a revenue model which we call pay as you store. And today it's called cooling as a service. We're actually charging the equivalent of 100 Naira to store 120 kilogram plastic crate inside the cold room for one day. And each cold hub can actually hold up to 150 of these crates, which is three tons of food. Over the past four years, we've deployed 54 cold hubs. In 2020, we were able to save 42,000 tons of food from spoilage, making this food available for local consumption. We've been able to sign up 5,250 farmers, retailers, and wholesalers as our users. And they scale their revenue from 60 US dollar to a minimum of 120 US dollar every month, simply by reducing previous 50% losses. We've created 66 new jobs for women by hiring and training them to work as our hub operators and market attendants across our sites. And we've saved more than 1 million kilograms of CO2 by using exclusively solar on all our installations, kicking out diesel generators completely. Having achieved this, we are now positioned to go to scale. And our plan is to deploy 100 cold hubs and 20 cold hub solar ice makers, the ice points, across Nigeria at farm clusters, aggregation centers, outdoor food markets, and fishing clusters. Integrate refrigerated transportation services so we can have a full cold chain, moving food from cold hubs in farm clusters and bringing them all the way to cold hubs in outdoor food markets and also start small scale production of returnable plastic crates so that we can have proper packaging for the food that goes into the cold rooms. 
Behind this scale is myself as CEO, supported by Bright, our chief of operations, Maxwell, who builds and maintains the code rooms, Teres, Swiss finance and admin for code hubs, and an additional 11 management staff who are supporting the work we are doing. This team is supported by a very highly experienced board, led by Chijo Kuzoho, energy economist, assisted by Osai Kuego as an economist, and also supported by David Rubin, a consultant to the Rockefeller Foundation uh, Food Waste Initiative. Together, we have been supported by a wide range of partners, from philanthropy to impact investors, and we continue in that space. So in a nutshell, that is what we are doing at Code Hubs, and uh, I will be very happy to stop the presentation and uh, hear your feedback. Thank you very much. Thank you so Thank you very much, Nemeka, for the presentation. I would like to invite Godfrey, being a neighboring country, probably have better <laughs> understanding of the landscape and the insights around their problem and probably give us your feedback on the company. And also a question around for Nemeka. Over to you, Godfrey. Okay, Alan, uh, thank you very much. And thank you, uh, Nemeka, for a very uh, sustained presentation. Uh, I think the problem we are trying to solve is evident post harvest losses. It's a big issue after farmers have spent all their sweat and money resources. They are not able to store to be able to turn those produce into income for to support their livelihoods. I have one question, and the rest a couple of uh, uh, advice uh, or suggestions for him. Um, Emeka, um, if you take one coal hub, at what percentage adoption does the coal hub break even? What I mean is one coal hub with the 150 crates. What percentage must they be taking for you to break even before you start making profit? Thank you very much, Geoffrey, for that question. So if you take one code hub now, uh, that code hub pre-COVID was 27,000 US dollar to put together. Post-COVID, because everyone is increasing the cost of materials, is now 34,000 US dollar to put together. So that code hub will break even in maximum 36 months. 36 months, including fluctuations in currency, the fluctuations between the Naira and the US dollar. You know. So the break even of one code room is three years. Uh, of course, it can break even, and that three years is just between 50 and 70% utilization rate. You know. If you can achieve 100% utilization, we can break even in 24 months. Okay, no, awesome. So like I said, look, this is uh, something you're doing and the need is there. A couple of things I saw from your presentation is that I feel, you know, you show it as vegetable, fruits, milk, fish, and meat. But I seem to think you are more along the lines of the vegetable and fruit space. You have to uh, stay in your lane, choose what you can easily do, because in the meat space, it's often not an issue because somebody just kills one goat and they are whatever and all of those things. And when you go into fish and milk, so choose your lane. The second piece is that I think uh, you are going to other business areas like uh, apart from the coal hub, you are looking at uh, logistics and you are looking at uh, the retainable crates. That's very important, it all integrates. But I, all, I feel one of the key value adds will be where you integrate into access to market so that you are more of an aggregator playing for them to store and increase their income on the percentage waste side, but also transparency in pricing because you are doing, you are the access to market play, tomato paste or something like that. If we use tomato as an example. So I just thought, you know, instead of you just sticking to what will bring it to the coal hub, if I store it in the coal room and I can't sell it, really, uh, uh, the next time I'll just do it for one day and won't come back. The other one is uh, to do with your financials. You have to consolidate them so that as uh, somebody looking at them, they look at the coal hub uh, uh, financial, look at the logistics and look at all of it. Yes, in separate whatever, but in a consolidated form and a single currency. 
because you have used dollar for one and naira in the other. And uh, make sure that your numbers tie up in the sense that when you say revenue in 2018 was $55,000. And of course you were doing, uh, if you then say a cold room is $27,000 times five, then that takes you to a hundred and something. Uh, let's uh, take a percentage of adoption. You will have to look at those numbers because any fellow who is giving you money wants to ensure that the economics of the business is sustainable. After, if it's uh, Dave gives you the money, after you have done that, you are sustainable on your own to be able to reinvest whatever you earn to scale up this business. But the area you are tackling is like a pain in the knee. And it's an important thing, not only in Nigeria, but something that can be replicated across most African markets. And I like the grit of it. Presentation is simple. Anywhere you go, you will see produce being rotten on the wayside. And that really breaks my heart. Thank, thank you and your team for the efforts you put in. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. I appreciate the comments, thank you. Thank you, Godfrey. I would like to do call upon uh, Jackin to maybe ask a question or so and also give uh, his feedback. Sure. Yeah, just um, I'll ask one question and then give some consolidated feedback. Um, so the one question that, that I would ask about is on the customer economic side. So I think, you know, Div is a fund that funds projects all around the world. And so oftentimes entrepreneurs like yourself are doing a bit of work to educate us on the problem and, you know, the value proposition to the customer. So it, what are the economics of, you know, you've mentioned that uh, customers experience a kind of doubling of their monthly income, um, but is that net of the costs of storage or, you know, like what, what is the kind of cost side of the equation look like for customers as well? Um, and, and so like, kind of like, what's the value proposition to the customer? And then I echo all of uh, Godfrey's comments on the unit economics and like, how do you recover the capital expenditure? Uh, Cause I think that would be really helpful for Div to understand if you were planning to apply for them. Thank you very much for the question, really. You know, let, let me start by saying, you know, like a basket of uh, tomato uh, during the off-peak season sells for about 40 US dollar equivalent, you know. You can only get 40 US dollar equivalent from 6 a.m. to 12 noon, you know, because the tomato has been very badly harvested. They have been put inside raffia baskets and the raffia is light wood that have needles which punctures the soft shell of the tomato and the tomato starts the watering, you know. Then the tomato comes in 16 hours road trip on the most difficult route you can imagine. So what is left on, on that tomato when it arrives the outdoor food market is just a little bit and it sells for that amount of money between 6 a.m. and 12 noon, you know. Between 12 noon, and uh, 3 p.m., that same basket of tomato that sold between 40, 60 US dollar in the morning sells for about 20, you know. From 3 p.m. to uh, 6 p.m., that same basket of tomato that sold up to 40, 60 US dollar in the morning sells for around 10, 15 dollar. Nobody buys the rotten tomatoes, but there is a market for rotten tomatoes and that is for local restaurants to convert into paste and so on. But you see, that basket of tomato can actually be saved for 100 naira. And you can sell that tomato for 8,000, 11,000 naira the next day. And you still have value of that. What Code Hubs is offering and the value that we are offering to the smallholder farmers, retailers, and wholesalers is an ability to maintain the price without incurring any loss at a very cheap rate. You know. We cannot be able to offer this service if we are running on diesel generators because the recurrence will be too high. And the only reason we can offer that storage service at 100 Naira is because we are running completely off the grid. So you do a heavy capex upfront and that heavy capex runs the infrastructure, you know. So the value proposition is that with a code hub, you save 50% of your stock and you also end that as fresh product the next day. Instead of selling it off, 
uh, uh, because of spoilage. Yeah. Great. Well, I know we're running up at the end of time, so I'll just close with like three comments. Uh, one, you guys are doing a really terrific job getting traction on a really tough problem uh, that nobody has really solved in a meaningful way at scale. So I would say kudos to you guys for, for the traction that you have to date. Um, if you're thinking about applying for div, you know, really kind of take the time to explain the, the value proposition and the, the kind of impact proposition for customers, uh, explaining the kind of cost effectiveness of the solution. And you can think of that in this case as explaining the unit economics of a cold hub, like do you recover your investment? Um, and, and lastly, uh, thinking about your customer acquisition strategy, you know, like at how expensive is it to acquire customers in an already capital intensive uh, business model? So that that's something they'd probably want to understand better. But again, congrats on all the progress to date and, um, you know, really tip my hat to you guys and, and the traction you've gotten. And I'll turn it over to Alan. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hakim. Thank you, Nemeka, also for taking the time to present to this panel. And now, uh, I just want to thank everyone for joining the session and the DIV team will follow up with the attendees to share more information about the funding opportunity and basically also around DIV selection criteria. But from the presentation, you notice that one of the four key areas they are focusing on are impact, sustainability, cost effectiveness, and pathway to scale. So anyone, any enterprise or anyone would want to apply for DIV Feature, those are some of the four key areas you need to look. Thank you all, my esteemed judges. Hope you'll participate in the remainder of the sessions, networking and also building partnership through the Brella. Have a good rest of the Sankalp time. Bye-bye for now. Thank you yeah, so much. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>